and welcome to the second interview of this academic year at Room for Discussion. And today we're pulling back a curtain on a world where finance meets detective work. The Financial Intelligence Unit is responsible for keeping our security system safe. And today we have a guest that makes sure that finance, terrorist financing, money laundering, and predicting offenses goes in place. During this hour, we'll look at what the FIU is, some of the biggest challenges to the security of our financial system, and also how our data is used in order to address those issues. However, all of that sounds a bit complex. Do you want to know what's really at stake here? Take out, of your, take out your bank app and you'll see all the information that you share with the FIU, from transactions to personal information. To discuss this further, please welcome the head of the FIU herself, Henny Weber Kusters, on our stage. Welcome. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Yes, please have a seat. Sure. <laughs> well, welcome to our couches. Um, we briefly explained what the Financial Intelligence Unit is in our introduction, introduction speech, but we are not the head of the FYU. So when people ask you about your work, how do we explain the importance of the FYU to our security? Um, the FYU in itself is is a hub where public and private parties come together in the fight against uh, money laundering, the predicate offenses to money laundering and terrorism financing. Because according to the anti-money laundering legislation, private sector, big parts of private sector are responsible to ensure that their customers are not involved in serious crime or money laundering or terrorism financing. They have to take their own precautions and whenever necessary, they report to the FIU whenever they believe that one of their customers is involved in crime, money laundering or terrorism financing. The FIU is the only organization that receives all this information from private sector. They analyze it, they work on it and whenever the FIU deems this to be of need, to law enforcement, the FIU disseminates it to law enforcement. So the FIU is really on the, on the crossing point. And when talking about FIUs, there are always two buzzwords that we hear. It is money laundering and terrorist financing, as you said. But how do people commit those crimes in practice? Huh. <laughs> <laughs> Um, in so many different ways, uh, it would take me days mm -hmm. to explain all of that. Um, but first of all, there's a big difference between money laundering and terrorism financing. Money laundering always starts with a crime. Because if we're talking about money laundering, we're talking about criminal money that uh, the criminals want to make to appear legitimate money so they can use it again. So you have several stages there, it is being placed, it is being covered and then brought into practice there to buy a house, a car, mm -hmm. or whatever, or invest in new crimes. If we're talking about terrorism financing, this is money that may come may from crimes, uh, but it may also be legitimate money that is being transferred uh, to be able to commit terrorist acts. So that's the that's difference, and because of that, there are also many different ways, both for money laundering and terrorism financing, how to appear. Um, but, well, you know, there are, there are several um, ways. For instance, in money laundering, if we're talking about uh, drug trade, a lot of drugs is being sold and paid for in cash, which means that drug traders, they have a lot of cash, and um, if you come with a big bag of cash to your bank, this bank is going to ask you a lot of annoying questions. So there are then very complicated ways, for instance, going abroad to another country where you can still uh, bring the cash into another account and from that account move it uh, with a so-called uh, payment to your own account in your own country. But, but again, there's 
huge complexity in the ways money laundering takes place. It is almost always international because that makes it more difficult to, uh, to follow it. And there's always a lot of steps between the crime and the money uh, being used again in, in our normal world. And to combat these crimes that you just outlined, the Dutch FIU has a unique structure. You're an independent part of the Dutch police that is connected to the Minister of Justice and Security, but you're also not a fully private entity like an NGO. Why is this particularly structure necessary when fighting those crimes? Yeah, that's, uh, that's a good question. If you look at an FIU, um, every country is uh, expected to have an FIU that is operationally independent. Um, and the reason for that, the reason behind it, is that FIUs also receive information on, for instance, corruption. Because there is corruption that is not connected to serious crime, but there is no serious crime without corruption. Hmm. And if you really want to fight corruption, you must have the opportunity to work independently, to work operationally independent. There cannot be any other organization entering your premises and telling you, I want to see what you have in your database. Because then it would all be compromised and you can never work safely mm. on, on corruption cases. Maybe in a big part of Europe, but in a lot of other parts of the world, that's simply impossible. Mm. So that's, that's the reason behind this prescription that an FIU must be able to act operationally independent. So we gather now that the FIU has a considerable power as a security actor in the state. You supervise and you monitor the financial system. However, who monitors the FIU? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, that's a very good question. Also here we see, uh, we, we see different uh, ways in where, where, that, where this is happening in countries. Um, in the Netherlands, there is no formal supervisor for the FIU, except that uh, the head of FIU, myself, mm -hmm. has to report to the Minister of Justice and Security uh, how the money has been spent, uh, what exactly have you been doing throughout the year. And of course, there are supervisory authorities who have the right and who do so also to look into how the FIU operates in the entire chain, because the FIU does never operate in itself. We are depending on what is coming in from the private sector. We have to work closely with law enforcement and public prosecutors. So there's a lot of partners closely surrounding us who can actually have an idea on how the FIU functions, how it is positioning itself. Um, but you're right, there's not a formal supervisor to the mm. FIU, the Netherlands. And since the FIU came to life, financial crime has changed. We talked about it in the guest room beforehand. Um, considering this, what would you identify as the biggest challenge for the FIU in recent years? In recent years, what has um, fundamentally changed the landscape is uh, the appearance of uh, cryptocurrencies, um, which is a totally different setup if you compare it to what we were used to. So this required us to really start analyzing, also to acquire IT uh, that h helps us to identify, to work through blockchains, etc. That is a, that's a big change. Um, well, as, as mentioned, uh, organized crime, as we know in the Netherlands, as you may all know from what you learn in the newspapers and in, in documentaries, is uh, heavy, it's serious, mm -hmm. and with that, the money laundering uh, is organized in a very professional way. Mm -hmm. And uh, that means also that the FIU really has to work with a lot of data, we do receive a lot of reports. Uh, we have and we want to be innovative. We have started to work closely with with private sector uh, to, to really cooperate more closely than we did before. We are heavily investing in our IT structures to help us to work through all these data. And of course, at the same time in, in society, the discussion has come up on, on privacy protection. 
and that's not also a, not always a happy marriage. Mm -hmm. You just mentioned crypto. In your 2023 report, which we also have laying over there, um, you talked a lot about high-tech crime, which crypto is also a part of. It's enabled through digital assets such as crypto and often through unregulated platforms. And we were wondering, due to the decentralized and anonymous nature of it, is prevention even possible? Absolutely. <laughs> oh. <laughs> well, That's <it> promising. <laughs> yeah, no. Um, the reporting obligation for the VASPs, it came into place just a couple of years ago. Um, so also for us, it was, uh, it was a new sector. And um, what, what has been very important is that uh, the VASPs operating from the Netherlands, they had to register with the central bank which means that uh, the, 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 the VASPs, the virtual asset service providers, they were known. They were known to the central bank, they were known to us. We could get in touch with them, um, explain to them what our role is, how we work. And what we have seen is that some of these uh, providers, they have left the Netherlands, they have left our country. Um, and some of them are working in a very positive way together with us. And I fully agree there are currencies, cryptocurrencies, that are more based on anonymity than others. Blockchain in itself is not anonymous, I would mm. say, because it, it's as transparent as can be. I, uh, that, that's, that's how I see it. Um, so yes, there are ways, but it is highly depending on the providers. And yes, mm. of course, there are providers who are not that good of goodwill and uh, wanting to cooperate with, uh, with, with governance, with authorities. Um, and this is indeed something where we work closely also with a lot of other FIUs mm. on the globe because any, any service provider in the, in the crypto does not work on a national basis. It, it is going global, and as FIUs, we are really working closely together to learn to understand how does it work, where are the vulnerabilities, what can we do about it. And without saying that we can, that we can identify everything, I would definitely not say it's impossible that we can identify a lot mm -hmm. that goes on through VASPs. And contrary to this emergence of high-tech crime, terrorist financing has been on the FYI agenda forever now. According to your annual review from 2023 that we have just here, if we can show it to the audience. You it's have on the website as well. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, make sure to check it out. According to your annual review, you had over 2 million reports made by nearly 2,000 entities, such as commercial banks, real estate agents, Trying to find terrorist financing in this huge amount of data can be like searching for a needle in a haystack. How can this process be effective in practice? Another good question. You were prepared. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, well, as, as mentioned, terrorist financing is, um, is really different from money laundering. Because when we're talking about terrorism financing, we're not trying to identify where the money came from. We're specifically interested in where the money goes to. Mm -hmm. And this is in itself a way to, to select uh, what might possibly be terrorism financing. Um, the real, real, real difficult and hard to detect uh, terrorism financing is what we have also mentioned is is the the threat of extreme right wing mm -hmm. terrorism um, the 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 well the individuals who are really radicalizing on their own mm -hmm. um, who are not that visible who are not part of a group who are not part of an organization. Um, I don't well yesterday there was this this stabbing incident in in Rotterdam. Those, those are the individuals that we can really only afterwards mm -hmm. try to identify. Have they had specific financial behavior? Because that's what we are looking at um, shortly before the incident to see if we can learn from that mm -hmm. and maybe identify other individuals. But this is extremely difficult. Mm -hmm. 
Um, we were actually wondering if it would be possible for you to give our audience an insight into maybe your most interesting investigation when it comes to terrorist financing. Hmm. Um, well, if it comes to financing, the, the, the most uh, obvious phase was when we had the, the foreign fighters Exodus from the Netherlands when there was the the the, the ISIL mm -hmm. ISIS um, situation in Syria when there was this this war from ISIS and um, what we managed to do then was work with with the private sector when when the first uh, individuals had left the country to to join this terrorist group over there where we identified how was indeed their financial behavior before they left. This led to some specific red flags mm -hmm. that we have then shared with the, with the private sector, specifically with the banks in those days, to identify if there are individuals uh, who have this, this profile, then it's important to report. And because we what we tried to do was to prevent them from leaving the country to join this group instead of noticing they have left. So those, this has led to some indeed very interesting investigations that did not get to, to, uh, to press uh, releases, of course. But that was, uh, that was something that we were um, satisfied with, although the situation was, was horrible, of course. And another uh, example which had not so much to do with terrorism financing, was um, in Utrecht a couple of years ago, there was this shooting in, uh, the, the in public transportation, yeah. in the tram. And pretty soon, police had published the name of the individual who, was, who, was, who had committed this, this shooting in order to identify where he, where he was as soon as possible. What happened then was that we were approached by a bank because all of the banks, they had really started going through all their data of all their, mm -hmm. their customers. And they had identified that they had a phone number of this individual in one of their documents. And then at those points in time, it really can go quickly mm -hmm. because they really picked up the phone. This is what we found. We found this number. Um, we provided this information to police immediately. So it was within hours? Within minutes. Within minutes? Yeah. Okay. And this, this helped police exec at in, in the end to identify where he was. Mm -hmm. And uh, it had nothing to do with financing, but it had to do with how the network can cooperate and can do that really quickly if the situation requests it. And Staying in the topic of terrorist financing, many scholars like Peter Newman know that those terrorist groups, especially in civil wars, wars they rely all on the financing from communities, charities, diasporas, state sponsors, and usually the political pressure and sanctions are needed to tackle those sources of financing. So can the FYU ever fully cover all the avenues of terrorist financing? Well, there is a simple answer to that question, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> if, if we could, mm -hmm. if we could actually do that, there would be no terrorism financing. Um, and taking into account the amount of terrorism we see around the globe, um, well, we can identify that we, and not just the FIU, but, but all the authorities, we have not been able to really disrupt the financial flow to, to those terrorist groups mm -hmm. entirely. Um, what we can do and what we have to do, I believe, is do whatever we can, is indeed provide private sector with as, as much as information as possible for them to detect it, to identify how does it work. And um, so, but no, if that, 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 that's my, my dream, mm -hmm. that we would be able to do that, because if there's no financing, terrorism will absolutely end, because without money, there's not so much terrorist acts that you can commit. Um, another big issue that emerged for you was in 2022, Russia's invasion um, of Ukraine. 
And then the EU subsequently introduced heavy sanctions that limit the amount of financing to and from Russia. Um, however, we now know that these sanctions are being avoided by intermediaries, for instance, in Kazakhstan or Armenia. Whose responsibility is enforcement here? Yeah, that's, um, well, in, in the end, uh, whether you um, avoid sanctions because uh, you deliver directly to Russia what you are not supposed to deliver anymore, or you do that through another country, it's still sanction evasion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and this means that, and this is also something we're working on heavily, because luckily, I would say, in the Netherlands, sanction evasion is a crime, is an economic crime, which also allows us to work on it from the money laundering perspective. But if you are a company who has always delivered specific goods, like chips, for instance, mm -hmm. to Russia, and all of a sudden you change um, your way of, of export and you deliver the same amounts of chips to one of the neighboring countries of Russia of whom you know that this country is friendly to Russia then still you should know and you should ask and you should check so it's, it's and of course it's not easy to prove but it's not that you can go free or mm -hmm. that you still deliver chips, but you pretend it's washing machines, mm -hmm. for instance. It's, it's all kinds of things that we, that we identify. It's simply not allowed. It mm -hmm. you, should, you should be able to identify what could possibly go to this sanctioned country. Mm -hmm. So FYUs has authority here when it comes to tracking those money transfers and then reporting them to the authorities. It's FYU's job. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. In the Netherlands it is, but this is indeed one of the weak points uh, in, in the, the sanctions legislation in Europe. Mm -hmm. Not in every country it is a crime if you evade sanctions. And if it's not a crime, then an FIU cannot work on it. Yeah. So that's, uh, that's a difficult thing. But with, with the countries where this is in their legislation, we also work really closely together also to identify jointly what happens with you? How does it look like with us? Are there connections um, to be able to, uh, to work on it uh, intensely? I think it's a high time now to open the floor to some audience questions, if we have any. If we don't, we, you'll also have an opportunity later on to ask a question. All right, we would like to move on with a bit of uh, data privacy. The EU General Data Protection Regulation states that public authorities, like financial intelligence units, are allowed to use personal data when they carry out an inquiry in the general interest. We think that this sounds quite broad. Um, what mechanisms are in place to ensure that the collected data is necessary for the investigation and that personal privacy is respected? Yeah. Um, well, first of all, um all the information that comes in in the FIU is coming in from private sector mm -hmm. and it's not because they like to do it, because <laughs> they have to do it. <laughs> it's, it's in the law. They're legally obliged mm -hmm. to report this to us and, and law is very specific on when and how to report to the FIU. Um, what, what enters into our database is heavily protected which means that only, and then literally only, members of the FIU have access to those data. Um, and only when we determine this is information that should go to law enforcement, then it moves on to law enforcement. But to be very specific, law enforcement, n nor public prosecutors, has ever access directly to our database. Um, and that, that in itself, of course, protects uh, these these privacy sensitive information heavily and if um, information that enters into our database after five years has not led to a dissemination to law enforcement it is being deleted then it's it's mm. it's gone okay. international cooperation between FIUs requires that data is shared with other countries we imagine um, there are certain countries where there are also FIUs where the reputation regarding data privacy is not 
how do we say this, on a European standard. Um, how can we ensure that our data is protected if it's shared with, for instance, Venezuela or Belarus? Um, well, first of all, with those two, two countries, we do not share information oh. anymore because mm -hmm. of specifically those reasons. Um, what we have in place is a safeguard that is called the Egmont Group of FIUs. Um, every FIU has to be a member of this organization to have access to the, the IT system that allows international information exchange. To be able to become a member of this group, you have to undergo a very scrutinous process where indeed data protection, security, screening of staff of FIUs is all being checked. And you literally have to subscribe what is called the principles for information exchange, which means that you really have to be able to prove that you will protect the data that you receive from, uh, from another FIU uh, in a very secure way. And if an FIU proves that it is unable to do that, then it is immediately cut off the system to protect information also coming from other FIUs. And it leads to, to heavy measures. So that's um, how, we, how we work with that. And yeah, and indeed, uh, specific countries like, like Russia, Belarus, we do not share information mm -hmm. with anymore. By the way, Russia is also suspended from the oh. Egmont group. Yeah. 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 What about an example if the data was shared with this country, however, they are no longer prohibited to be involved in this international cooperation. What happens with the data then? Yeah, that, that's a good question, because that is something you can never tell. Mm -hmm. And uh, because if, if we look at the, the FIU of, of Russia, mm -hmm. um, the data we have shared with them once, they're in their hands, and indeed there is, there is no way we can uh, in, in any way now check what, what they do with it or what they don't do with it. Um, you said that we cannot check what is done with the data, but if an individual still has um, certain fears in regards to their privacy rights, is there anything that they can do as legal recourse? There is, there is always uh, a possibility, uh, based also based on, on the law, to get an insight in what data are available where, where again, our, our own internal ba database is, is heavily protected. And we will never ever share anything with anybody <laughs> with that database. Yeah. And we would like to stay in the topic of, of data and data protection. And according, we keep coming back to this annual review of 2023. According to it, you experienced a data breach. Um, which can obviously fuel the concerns about the privacy of individuals. So my first question would be, how could that happen? Um, that was a, a, a technical default of the, of the system that, that we have. And, um, well, that of course means that we are now working, uh, first of all, uh, on, on the working processes as long as the system hasn't changed. Mm -hmm to uh, build in additional checks and balances and controls to ensure that this will not happen again. Um, and we are now working on a new system mm -hmm. because we have learned uh, what are the weak spots in, in what, has, wh what we have now in our IT, uh, in our IT application and uh, to, to avoid this for next time. Mm -hmm. So it was, it was really a technical uh, issue. Mm -hmm. And has anyone from the outside of the FYU investigated this data breach or was it just an internal audit? It was an internal audit mm -hmm. and it was uh, reported to the, uh, to the privacy authority. Mm -hmm. Dutch uh, protection authority, yeah. right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, don't you think that the outside expertise might be necessary in this situation? Well, what we have done is that we have kept the privacy authority updated mm. on every step that we took, on our findings, our conclusions, and uh, it, if they would have felt that that would be needed, then of course we would have done it. But again, um, the, the question is, because it is such an FIU-specific IT system, it would be difficult to find anybody on a very short, short time frame mm -hmm 
who could really work on, on this to, to really understand how the system works mm -hmm. and understand what had happened. Mm -hmm. So it, it, wasn't, it wasn't difficult, but a lot of work. Yeah. Um, at the beginning of the interview, we brought up cryptocurrencies, um, and it is one of the examples how legislation differs across jurisdictions. In Europe, it's rather harmonized, we have a lot of regulation on it, but there are still different regulatory frameworks out there that different FIUs have to operate within. Um, how do you ensure e efficient international cooperation in those different regulatory frameworks? Yeah, well, this is of course not just the case with crypto. Mm -hmm. yeah. This 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 goes for for the entire range of of, uh, of criminal law, um, and it is exactly for that reason that within the Egmont Group we have we have this this set of agreements where we say this is the way how how we cooperate, and that also means that um, you you can ask any question for information from any other FIU, if you have reasons to ask for that, if you have reasons to believe that in that country there is information available that might be of interest to you. But you have to accept that not every FIU has access to the same, to the same data, to mm -hmm. the same data sources. Um, so is it as effective and efficient as it could be? No, by no means. At the same time, there's the reality of life that we, we cannot prescribe to the world how to arrange in, in every jurisdiction how the law should look mm -hmm. like. Those are political processes. And yes, I, I, I would definitely love that our European world would be exported, but that's a very colonial uh, mm. <laughs> behavior. Yeah. <laughs> and as you mentioned now, the Egmont Group in 2021, you ended your term as the head of the Egmont Group, which is the International Network of Financial Intelligence Units. And about this international cooperation, there has been a study by European Parliament on a proposed anti-money laundering authority, mainly common EU FYU. Do you think that this new institution would solve those problems with cross-border cooperation? I, I am very happy with, mm -hmm. with this, this new authority to come. I am sure this will help us to, to move forward in a much more effective and efficient way, but it's only EU. And um, if, if you look at, at our current situation, the FIUs in the EU, we already have a lot of possibilities. We have an obligation, for instance, a payment service provider like Adyen mm -hmm. or Modi, who is located in the Netherlands, but they provide services around the globe. Mm -hmm. um, if they report to us uh, a transaction between somebody in France and somebody in Germany, we are obliged to send this to both France and Germany. Mm -hmm. uh, this, this is already in place in, in Europe, so we, we have a lot already, and it's even going to be better. Yeah. I, I'm st I strongly mm -hmm. believe in that. But then again, it's, it's adding up to what is already a very positive situation. Mm. Um, the new European regulation also allows what is called third countries mm -hmm. to, to be part of, for instance, joint analysis. But yeah, it, it will help us, but on the European level. Mm -hmm. um, another policy proposal that was mentioned um, was just creating stronger cooperation and information exchange among national FIUs, not having a European one. We were wondering, there are so many structural differences among FIUs in Europe. Why is this the case? And why has stronger information exchange and cooperation not happened, considering that we have a common market, currency, common banking regulation? Why are FIUs still so distinct? Um, well, again, based on the Financial Action Task Force recommendation, every country must have an FIU that is properly equipped, that is operationally independent. At the same time, it's a relatively new authority. Mm -hmm. it, it exists for a bit over 30 years now. If you look at, at authorities like police, if you look at authorities like public prosecutors, they have been there for ages. They have, they have their position in, in the structure of a country and all of a sudden they had to plug in 
an FIU in, in these structures that already existed in all these countries. Mm -hmm. And that means that in the end, it probably was the one who was responsible for implementing this, this new thing called FIU mm -hmm. um, to identify where do we place it. And that's for that reason, it ended up in many different places, many different setups. And with that, with different competences, with different authorities, with different possibilities to, to work. Um, at the same time, if you look at the money laundering directives in Europe, over the years, the cooperation between EU FIUs has really been supported and enhanced. And yeah, we, we have received a, a lot of additional means to, to really cooperate. And, and again, with the new package, I expect it's even going to be better. But the different setup will probably not change in a short while. So staying in the topics, topic of those differences, we know that Dutch FYU is very active, FYU in Great Britain is very active. Um, but in the Netherlands, two institutions in 2023 were responsible for 55% of all the reports. How significant is that role of national credit institutions in influencing the effectiveness of those crime-fighting efforts, effort different jurisdictions? Because if the, in the Netherlands two entities are responsible for 55, if those two are not present in another country, how does that influence this effectiveness? Um, I think those are really, you should look at that as, as two different topics because mm -hmm. the reason why, uh, for instance, there was there was was one bank who mm -hmm. was responsible for, if I remember it properly, seventy five percent or something of all the banking reports. This had to do with the fact that they reported in a different way. Luckily, most of the banks they they bring together reports that that uh, are that are interlinked and they send it in one report. Mm -hmm. What this bank did was send each and every transaction separately. Mm -hmm. And then for us to identify what, what came out of that. So um, they are changing that now. So yeah. the in over this year, we already identified that, that this, this amount is, is going back, but the quality is getting up. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's not like the more we get, the happier. Mm -hmm. It's definitely also about quality and, and the linkage between what they're reporting. Mm -hmm. And... It was a huge case a couple of years ago of ING being heavily fined for not cooperating with FYUs and not reporting. Do you think that's a good strategy to force banks to report quality data to you? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> so no, let's take another carrot. It's, it really was the situation um, by then, by mm -hmm. ING, was very bad. Mm -hmm. It it was um, yeah no it was very bad. I will I will save you. <laughs> 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 and that was really unacceptable. And I think uh, th I I still applaud the public prosecutor's office that they took it up and mm -hmm. the way they have investigated it. Um, and what you can also notice is that when when that criminal investigation started. From that time on, all of the banks started to invest mm -hmm. in their in their compliance because until then, this was something. Uh, yeah, yeah, we we still have to do the compliance. Don't complain. Don't bother me. As less as people as we can possibly have, tick the box and move on. Don't bother me with that. And this situation has really changed. If you look now at the boardrooms of the banks, compliance is really it's a huge sector. in that room. Yeah. And I, I really believe this should be the case. Mm -hmm. um, we would like to zoom out again a bit more. You are also the head of the Egmont Group. Um, in the 2023 reports, <laughs> um, you noted that some advancements has been made toward making the group more efficient. Um, what would you identify as the major improvement over the recent years? Um, well, that's first of all that the group has now its own IT system mm -hmm. because until then it was provided by the American FIU and that that is very generous because it, it, is, it was a great, great contribution of the, the Financial Intelligence Unit of the US. Mm -hmm. 
But still, as an organization, you cannot and should not depend on one of your members for what is your, your major way of communication. And was it provided by Duez because it was too costly to implement in... Yeah, from the b you know, this, this was done from the outset. Mm -hmm. the, the Egmont group, when it started, it was 10, ten members or so. Mm -hmm. And the US was one of the founding members of the Egmont group, and they then stepped forward by saying, well, we will provide the, the communication channel. Mm -hmm. And then everybody got used to that situation. Mm -hmm. But still, for a professional organization, this cannot be the case. So that was the main reason uh, why, we, why we have developed and moved on to having the Egmont Secure Web as uh, something from the Egmont group itself. And that is, that is I believe, very important. Um, what also has, uh, well, not, not necessarily changed, but has improved, mm -hmm. is that whenever we do a project to understand how, how specific crime types look like, for instance, human trafficking, illegal wildlife trade, we always end up with recommendations to private sector. How could you possibly, in, in your sector, identify financial behavior that could trigger, that could lead to identifying this type of crimes? Mm -hmm. And I think that's important because it's good for FIUs to understand how it looks like, but it's as important for private sector to be a good gate gatekeeper to understand how it works, what to look for. You previously mentioned that there are arrangements within the Egmont group, for instance, towards data privacy, that there is a common agreement. Um, we were wondering, those agreements, are they international legal arrangements, or are they more just arrangements between the FIUs themselves, but not with the states or like any legal um, structure? No, this is really something of the organization, mm -hmm. but what makes it extremely powerful is that you cannot cooperate internationally with other FIUs if you're not a member of the Egmont group, mm -hmm. if you have no access to this Egmont Secure Web. Um, so that means that although it is not based on international laws, it's very effective because no FIU can, can allow not to have access, because mm -hmm. you simply, if you take yourself seriously, if you really want to achieve something, you cannot work without international cooperation. Mm -hmm. And we just mentioned some improvements in the Egmont group, so the common IT system, um, Egmont Secure Web, is used for exchanging information worldwide, but we're wondering what is still the biggest limit of the Egmont group? that needs to be addressed in the near future? Um, that's joint analysis. Mm -hmm. Because uh, until now, and this is also the, a, a, a big step forward soon for the European FIUs, what we do now is I ask you something, you give me an answer, you ask me something, I give you an answer, and then both in our own silo, we are working on a case. Whereas if you look at, at money laundering, at international crime, it is really very important that analysts more or less jointly look at the information that, that's available, identify what more information would be needed. And right now, um, we both do not have all the tools and we do not always have the legal possibilities mm -hmm. to start doing that. And that, but because I really believe that's the future. So if you had a magic wand that would be, and you could change something, that would be the common regulatory framework and those tools that you need. Yep. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, we were wondering if an FIU performance within the Egmont group is inadequate. Who are they responsible to, the Egmont group or the national government? Again, if, if an FIU? If one of the FIUs within the Egmont group their performance is inadequate. Who are they responsible to? The Egmont group, the other FIUs, or are they more responsible to their national government? Um, well, in essence, if you, if you breach the Egmont principles for information exchange, um, and we recently had, had, one of, uh, had, had an example where information that was confidential, that was shared by another FIU, 
ended up in hands of one of the politicians in that country. So that FIU is now uh, shut off the mm -hmm. account secure web and further steps will be taken. So at first instance, the Egmont group will react, will protect also the other FIUs to ensure that not more information will end up in, in places where it should not be. Um, but then what we almost always, always see in those cases is that we have to look carefully in what's the local situation of that FIU. How is their legal setup? And quite often this then will have to lead to legal changes in this specific country. And again, an FIU cannot work if it does not have access to the Eggman Secure Web. Mm -hmm. And it is also so that every country regularly is being, um, well, let's, let's say, checked, assessed by the FATF, the Financial Action Task Force. And if this would be the case, then this really leads to a bad assessment. Mm -hmm. And the bad assessment has economic consequences. So there, there is a lot of drive to ensure that an FIU is properly equipped and has also the, the right legal setup to do what it is supposed to do. Now, maybe we can also look at our audience and see if we have any audience questions. Yes, man here. Yeah, the microphone will come to you. Uh, I was just wondering, uh, where does the FIU find that the majority of funds for terrorist organizations is coming from? Is it from, you know, drug trade, if the international uh, criminal organizations, or is it sometimes from international corporate organizations? And amongst that, does that tend to be primarily in the EU, or is it joint between, you know, these organizations are running between, um, you know, the EU and other places? Um, that's a pretty difficult question because, as mentioned earlier, the question was, do, do you see it all? And the answer is no, by no means. Um, so I can, uh, I can only say something that we see and then also specifically in, in the Netherlands. Uh, what we see then is a mixture of individuals who, who really earn their own money, who have a proper job but who then spend part of their income uh, to, to send it to either through NGOs um, to, to terrorist organizations. And what we identify um, regularly, that's, that's also in, in the report, is that um, terrorist groups make use of easy ways to fraud. Um, and that by, by easy, low-hanging fruit, so to speak, easy, pet, petty crime, and that is also being used as, as an income for, for terrorist groups. But that's, that's really mainly from our domestic insights. I am sure because of the big amounts that we see around the globe, um, we expect that stately actors, as we, as we call them, are also, and we all know that, are funding terrorist groups. And that's the main chunk. And that's also, for that reason, extremely difficult to tackle. Okay, do we have another one? Yes. Uh, hello, thank you for coming. I was wondering, does it affect you personally that the sanctions against Russia uh, have proven to be so ineffective? Um, does it affect me personally? Yes, it does. Um, and this has to do with the fact that um, I have, I, I was in a position as chair of the Egmont Group when the invasion started. I remember being approached by the FIU of Ukraine, please disconnect us from the Egmont Secure Web because we do not know who will enter our premises tomorrow. Um, and that shocked me terribly. Of course, we did that. We also disconnected the Russian FIU. Um, and, and ever since, it, it is my strong belief, uh, and not only as an FIU, and not only through sanctions, that we have to do whatever lies within our powers to go against Russia and to prevent money in any way going there and, and supporting this, this aggressive behavior. So, yeah, in that way, it does affect me personally. 
thank you. Do we have any more questions? Yes, we have two. Maybe gentleman there. Uh, hi, so I was wondering about the use of AI because you have to analyze a lot of data and also find patterns. So I was wondering whether it's more that the FIU finds patterns and then the banks uh, like send what they found the patterns or do you also use AI to, to find those patterns for you in the cases that you already have? So far the FIU has no AI uh, in, in, in use. Uh, it is something that in the future might be something that we would want to introduce. Uh, but you're right, we are finding through our analysis, we are finding specific patterns, specific trends that we are sharing with the reporting entities. So not only with the banks, but with, with all the private sector for them to introduce it in their monitoring systems wherever possible to identify whether they have transactions that, that are in line with these trends and patterns. Does that answer your question? Yes, we have time for one more audience question, if there is one. Yes, there was one here in the first row. Uh, so we hear increasing reports of the Netherlands becoming a narco state. Um, and I was just curious to ask, in what way do you think the FYU has been effective in um, law enforcement's operation to stop that? Or are the criminal organizations too professional, too powerful to be stopped from money laundering in that way? Effectiveness, it, yeah, you're, you're touching on a very, very important point here. Effectiveness is, um, is something that, that drives discussions in the, in the entire world that is busy with anti-money laundering heavily. Effectiveness is also key to the assessments of the Financial Action Task Force. And at the same time, it's extremely difficult to measure it because you do not know what, what would have happened if you wouldn't have done what you did. Um, what has happened in the last assessment of the Netherlands, um, which was finalized in 2020, is that uh, FATF has a specific method where it looks at how many transactions come in, how many goes to law enforcement, how many inve investigations were started, uh, where did it lead to, and um, the conclusion was that FIU information in 60% in of all the investigations of our fiscal intelligence and investigation service, FIU information was being used. Um, those, those are the kinds of KPIs that, that FATF uses in its assessments to really identify effectiveness. So it, it, is, it is not something where you can be very absolute and say it's yes or no or 90% effective or, but um, the Netherlands has received uh, also compared to many other countries, a very high rate in the effective use of financial intelligence. And that's something I'm very proud of. <laughs> Does that answer your question? Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, we are coming slowly to the end of the interview. Time passes fast in a good company. Um, first, let's look a bit into the future. We keep coming back to the report, and according to it, you um, experienced a decrease in case files for terrorist financing from 400 in 2019 to 183 in 2023. Do you think that terrorist financing will become a less pressing issue for the FYU? No, it will not, definitely not. Um, as long as there are, there are terrorist groups, as long as there are terrorist acts, there is terrorism financing. But uh, what I already mentioned in the beginning, um, also looking at the observations of our intelligence services, um, terrorism in, in our countries is, is shifting mm -hmm. to, to individuals to uh, extreme right wing. And we are really still trying to identify, also with other FIUs, how does it look like? How does the financing here look like? Is it something that the private sector possibly can identify so far? Because you must be sure when you ask private sector to, to look at specific uh, behavior, 
to report it, but it is more or less impossible that everybody who buys a knife and pays for it is being reported to the FIU. That's not the situation where you want, want to end into. But this is, this is something where we will be very active in. Mm -hmm. And again, but we must be able to provide private sector with red flags, with how to identify possible terrorism financing. Mm -hmm. Last, we'd like to know if someone would make a movie about your time at the, at the FIU, what would be the, the proudest moment or the, the most interesting uh, moment in the movie? The proudest moment would be uh, the moment of the arrest of the shooter in, in Utrecht. Mm -hmm. It's a direct, immediate contribution to the safety and security of people. And that's that's the most important thing. Well, that's the message to all the movies director <laughs> that will see this interview. Well, thank you so much. It was a great pleasure to have this conversation with you on our stage. And let's thank our guest with a big round of applause. Thank you. And for those of you who can't get enough of room for discussion, we obviously have great, great news. On the 2nd of October, we will host on our couches Barbara Barsma, Chief Economist of PwC, former CEO of Rabo Carbon Bank. So make sure to be here from 1 to 2, as always, on our couches. Um, and for those of you who would like to sit on our couches next, we might have even better news. Room for Discussion is recruiting right now for marketing officers and interviewers. Applications are open till the 29th of September, so please make sure to apply before that um, through our website. Thank you, everyone, for your attention today, and yeah. See you next time.